How's that? Am I coming through good? Oh, there we are. Hey, oh, Lisa's on the mic. She's got me, she's got me cranked. It's good, yeah. You're tuning in too. All right. Um, all right. Hey, so good morning again. Hey, if you guys are jumping on online with us too, welcome. Glad to have you guys um, online. I know some of you guys couldn't make it this morning. And we are praying for you, um, for your uh, health, and for you to come back and worship with us quickly. Um, we're going to be in Mark again this morning. If you guys weren't able to grab one of those books, um, you can go ahead and do that right now. Like, I'm not, I'm not going to worry about you standing up and walking. Oh, my wife. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. All right, yeah, grab a book. Um, so one of the most... I think depressing ways that someone can start a conversation is when they come up to you and they're like, hey, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but every time the butt comes, it's like, oh man, like, or, you know, are you sitting down for this one? Um, like that's not, a, you don't walk up and you're like, hey, hate to be the bearer of bad news. Um, on the contrary though, um, imagine for me with a minute that you're, you're walking down the street and um, you're just kind of, you know, out for your daily walk maybe, and um, one of your friends comes like sprinting up to you. They're out of breath because they just couldn't wait and they had to run as fast as they could. And they're like, listen, I've got really good news for you. All right, so imagine they do that. Now think in your life, what would that good news be? Like what good news are you waiting on? What is it in your life that if someone ran up and they're like, I've got really good news, you've been waiting on this particular thing to hear that it's good news, right? Maybe it um, has to do with the health of you or a loved one. Maybe there's good news about that. Maybe it's about a job. Maybe it's about a relationship that there's some difficulty in. Maybe it's something like that. But what good news are you or have you been hoping for? What would that be in that moment? We're going to be in Mark chapter 1, but I want to go back first in time, and I want to do a little bit of um, historical uh, digging, if you will, starting all the way back at the beginning uh, during the time of creation. I mean, we're not gonna, I'm not going to have you turn to these passages, but I want to go just on a short little journey with you to build some anticipation that will get us into Mark chapter 1. So in Genesis 3... Sin enters the world, there's the deception, there's the fall, there's the disobedience that, that causes sin to enter. And here's what God says to the serpent in Genesis 3, 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now that's a prophecy about Jesus and about the, the spiritual battle between the enemy and the Son of God. But depending on what you believe about the timing of creation, now this is not important for this morning. We can debate much later if you want to. But this would have been around, or not around because this is like a big gap, but somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 B.C., depending on what you believe about the timing of the creation account. Okay, But that's not important. But, but that long before the, the birth of Christ is when this prophecy is given. Okay, Thousands of years before. Then we jump to Genesis 49, and Jacob is on his deathbed, and he's giving his final blessing to his sons. And he gets to Judah, and here's what he says in verse 10 of Genesis 49. He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of all the peoples, or another translation, is all the nations. So this is a promise of a king who's going to come and rule and command obedience of the nations. This is a prophecy about Christ coming through the line of Judah and ruling. Bible timelines would place this event, the death of Jacob, sometime around 1700 B.C. So we're thousands of years later now to Genesis 49, and we are 1700 years before the birth of Christ. Numbers 24, 17. Balaam is giving an oracle, and here's what he says. He says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. That was sometime around 1400 B.C. So we're moving through history. All right, one more, Isaiah 42, 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This happened sometime around 700 B.C. 
And then other Old Testament books are all full of prophecies as well, like Zechariah, who was, uh, that was written about 500 BC. So we go from thousands of years before Christ, we move on through history, and then we get to 500 BC. So from the beginning, all the way throughout Israel's history, this promised king, this ruler that is going to come through the line of Judah, this is a promise that's given to Israel, and they're reminded of it and reminded of it. And, you know, hundreds of years they're in captivity, and then they have someone, a prophet, come and remind them that they are God's chosen people, and one will come eventually to ultimately redeem them. The period of the prophet ends, uh, prophets ends, and Israel enters this seemingly silent era of 400 years where they don't really hear much from God. This is the, the intertestamental period. This is between the Old and New Testaments, this period of time. The hope and anticipation, generation after generation after generation, of these people just waiting and anticipating this king, this ruler that's to come. And then, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. It serves as kind of a preface to the whole entire book of Mark, but this is what the whole thing is about. So Mark 1.1, 1, 1, if you guys have those journals or your Bibles, go ahead and open there, Mark 1.1. 1, 1. So all the anticipation, here's how Mark begins. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Evangelio, good news. The beginning of the good news has come. And his name is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. The news that you have been waiting for for thousands and thousands of years has arrived. Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ is a title given to the anointed one. So Jesus, the anointed one, the Son of God, has come to do the Father's work on earth. And the book of Mark begins with this wild prophet in the wilderness who comes to proclaim this Jesus who is coming. He comes to herald to the people. So 1-1 one, one is kind of this preface, right? This is the beginning of the good news of Jesus, the Son of God. The whole entire book is going to revolve around that statement. But Mark starts now with John the Baptist. So let's go, and I've kind of broken this into, into three sections. Um, it's not really like main points that are like application necessarily, but it's just kind of, hey, here's this section, here's this section, and here's the last. The first one is called the prophecy of preparation. The prophecy of preparation. This is verses 2 and 3. And here's what it says. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, small Bible study note for you guys here this morning, um, and it's about this prophecy. Now, in all of the early manuscripts, some of you might like tune me out here, but that's okay. In all of the early manuscripts, 97% of them actually have... Um, uh, as it is written in the prophets. Doesn't name Isaiah by name. As it is written in the prophets. Now this is important because verse 2 is actually a prophecy out of the book of Malachi. It's not from Isaiah. And verse 3 is a prophecy out of Isaiah. So Malachi 3.1, if you want to note that, is verse 2. And then verse 3 is Isaiah 43. Now, this has created a lot of debate amongst biblical scholars simply because it would appear that Mark is wrong in his quotation. Well, why would he say Isaiah the prophet if it's actually from Malachi? Um, but again, just a small little note that you can tuck away. It doesn't really matter for this morning. Um, but when quoting multiple prophets at once, typically the writer would name the one who was most well-known even though there might have been a few that he was quoting. That's why some English translations and some early manuscripts have Isaiah. So... Tuck it away, shelf it, brain, you know, wherever you store that stuff in your brain. I'm not sure if it's the left or the right or the back or the front. I don't know, but store it somewhere, all right? So, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare the way. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer, as he was known, was the messenger who was sent to prepare the way, to make the path straight. For Jesus. Now, I want to ask you a question. Um, this is, you know, your background, but is anyone here from up north where it's like winter most of the year? 
Okay, a few of you, all right? I went to school, I went to college in Northeast Pennsylvania. Um, I wouldn't recommend visiting. There's nothing there but like a couple pizza parlors and Scranton, um, but they didn't, you know, the office is based there, but they didn't film it there, so big bummer. Um, but I went to school right outside of Scranton, Pennsylvania, where it feels like winter is there for like eight months out of the year. Um, it's miserable. I don't like it. Some people love the cold. Um, but what happens when it's winter? Waterfalls, right? Water falls into the road, cracks and little potholes, and it freezes and it expands, and then those potholes grow, and they grow, and all of a sudden, it's big enough to swallow your car. And this is how the roads are after the winter in the north. Now, fortunately, there's equipment that comes through to repair those roads, right? Back in the day, roads weren't paved, um, and, and they weren't maintained like they are today. So when a king came to town, he would send someone ahead of him, a representative, to make sure that the roads were ready for that king to come. His team would remove rocks, they would fill holes, they would cut down hills if there were any, and they would make that journey a lot easier and more smooth for the king. So if we translate this, what is being said, to kind of a metaphorical spiritual act, then what we see very quickly is that John, as the representative of the king, is coming to clear the hearts of the people, preparing them for the coming Messiah. So this is what John is doing. He's preparing the way of the Lord, making his path straight. This was a, a, a statement that would have made sense because of what was common at that time. So this is what John is coming to do. This is a prophecy from, again, like hundreds of years earlier that is being fulfilled as we see it now. Then we come to kind of the meat of the message. All right, we come to verses 4 through 8, and this is the, the message of preparation. So we have the prophecy that John is fulfilling, and now we have the message that he is proclaiming. Let's look at verses 4 through 8. It says, John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So we see John's method is one of proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, we need to be careful here not to read that what John was preaching was, was repentance and forgiveness by baptism. He wasn't saying, come and be baptized because that's what's going to cleanse you, that's what's going to forgive you of your sins. He was preaching repentance and then baptizing. This is what he was doing. He was baptizing those who were repentant. By the way, here's another small note that I learned. Baptism is not a new thing, right? It's, we kind of read this and we go, oh, he's baptizing people. But where did baptism come from? Where did he get this idea of, of, sub, of, of immersion, baptizing people in the, in the Jordan? Like, where did he get that from? Well, it was actually a common practice um, for Gentile proselytes to be baptized by, by Jews when they would convert into Judaism. So, so when a Gentile would come and wanted to become a part of the family of God in that way, in the Old Testament, they would be baptized to become one of the members of Israel. So this wasn't a new concept. The baptism was something that, that was going on already. So that wasn't what was radical about this event. The radical nature of it was the call to repentance, the call to completely turn from your, your, your style of life, the way you were living, to, to only focus on the coming Messiah, which, by the way, if you think about it, He's proclaiming this, this, this message of repentance, but Jesus isn't even here yet publicly, right? He will be in like literally just 30 seconds, um, but he wasn't here yet. So John's preaching this message, this, this Messiah is coming, the, the king is coming, you need to repent and prepare yourself for his arrival. So this is the message that he's preaching, he's baptizing people, they're coming just in droves, crowds of people, all Judea, all of Jerusalem, they're coming, they're repenting, they're turning and they're living for an anticipation of this coming king. And, and like I just said, it drew much, much attention, right? In fact, we see in Matthew, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees come, and I won't expound on that, but John kind of takes that as a moment to call them out and, and to kind of throw some judgment at them because they weren't willing to repent and turn. 
They were just kind of coming to, to raise their noses at everyone who was down there. And John calls them out. But everyone was coming down because of what was happening. This, this, this message that John was preaching in, in, the, in the crowds that were forming and people were so interested to know what was going on. And here's the crazy thing. Is that John was kind of a weird dude. Like John wasn't this, you know, like super well-to-do, like, you know, coming from a really well-known and, and wealthy family. Like he was a guy that lived in the wilderness and ate locusts. And I just have to imagine for the sake of my own mind, him like with a cup of honey and he was like dipping the locusts, okay? Like I just, that's the only way I can justify eating the insects, all right? Maybe he was doing that, probably not. Um, but that's what he ate. He ate that. He was wearing camel's hair, which, have you ever been on or, like, touched a camel? I can't imagine. It's, it's like the Christmas sweaters you get growing up, right? And you're like, oh, mom, it's so itchy. I can't wear this. And this is what John wore. Like, he's wearing camel's fur. Um, but he's wild. He's just a wild dude, right? Probably looked like, I don't know, like Tom Hanks in the volleyball. Who knows? Maybe he's, like, talking to plants. But this wild prophet from the wilderness... Listen to what Jesus says about him in Matthew eleven eleven. right? This wild guy preaching this message. Jesus says, truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Jesus says those words about John the Baptist. Why does he say that? Well, because John is laser focused on this mission of preparing the way, preparing the hearts of the people to receive Jesus. He wasn't some extraordinary scholar. He wasn't some, you know, pristine athlete. He wasn't a rock star. He wasn't a CEO. He was a man that believed that his life should be about the proclamation of the one who would come to bring salvation to the world. And that's all that mattered. He bought into his role, his responsibility to take forth that message. So let's get back into verse 7, okay? Let's get back into verse 7. Let's see how this plays out. Um, here's the message that John is preaching, right? He preached saying, um, after me comes he who is mightier than I. So he's preaching a message of someone greater, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. Now, I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. He says that for a reason. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is another amazing thing, is that somehow John knows about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit hasn't even, hasn't even been introduced yet until Acts. But there's this idea of a spirit, like it's been mentioned throughout some of the scriptures in the Old Testament. But he calls him the, the Holy Spirit. Somehow John is in tune with what's going to happen as Jesus comes. Kind of a weird thing to say about the sandals, so let me give you some context there. Here's uh, an old rabbinic saying, dated after Christ, but very likely it's contemporary to Christ. This is a quote from a commentary. I'm not, this is not my words. But here's what it states. It states that disciples ought to do everything for their masters that a slave does except for one thing, except for untying his sandals. So do everything, and this is found, and I, and I had the, there was like a, like a rabbinical book that actually it was quoted from, like this is in one of their like books of teaching. So this was too much to ask for a Jew to do for another Jew. Like you do everything for your master, but you don't stoop down to untie his sandals. That is the one thing that you are not required to do. So, John says, in his right perspective of one mightier than I, is that he's the master, I'm just his servant, and I'm not even worthy to, to, to get down here is what, is what the, the rabbis teach. Um, I'm, not even, I'm not even worthy to, to stoop down and untie his sandal. Like, that's, that's where I am compared to where Christ is. The thing that I am not supposed to do, I'm not even worried, worthy to get down there and do that because I am less than a servant when it comes to the mightiness uh, of, of the might of Jesus. I'm not worthy to stoop down and tie. So that's something that they would have heard and they would have understood. But the point of that is that John has a proper perspective of Jesus, right? He has a proper perspective of the authority and the prominence of Christ, right? He's, he's just like, man, he, he's so great. He's so powerful. He's so holy that I'm not even worthy to perform the, more, the most degrading task of a servant. I, I, I can't even stoop down to that level and even imagine it. And this is what he uses to preach the greatness of Christ. Right? He uses these common, these common ideas that people would have understood if they were in, in the Jewish um, school of thought. And, and he's using this, he's saying, I'm not even worthy for that. He's so great that I'm not even worthy. But yet, I'm still out here proclaiming this message. He gets it. He understands his role. 
Now, Mark leaves a bit of this message um, out of his account. Matthew in chapter 11, if you were to go and read um, chapter 11 of his gospel, he actually um, adds some judgment to those who don't repent. He, he spends a lot of time in, in Matthew um, talking about how, how he comes to, to judge and to place judgment and to separate. And he uses his winnowing fork to separate the, the wheat and the chaff. And he kind of uses that in, in this, this mini sermon that he's preaching. So there's more to it than just this. Mark, like we talked about last week, Mark is the, the gospel of action. So he's more concerned with what Jesus does than what Jesus teaches or what other people teach. So Mark leaves a little bit out. But the point is this, is that John is just coming. He's like, man, there is one who is far greater. Like, look what's going on here. Look at the crowds that are coming. Look at the interest that, that is being garnered amongst people for, for what this message is that I'm preaching. Look what's happening. But even here, look at this. Something greater is about to happen. Something far more powerful is coming. I baptize you with water. Yes, you, you, you repent and I baptize you with water, but the one who's coming that is mightier than me, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Like, what does that mean? Can you imagine these people going, what? Baptize me with the what? The Holy Spirit. Like, I get water. That's tangible. That's physical. It's symbolic. I'm being cleansed. Like, I get it. It doesn't clean me, but it's a symbol of that. But what do you mean the Holy Spirit? Like, I, I don't know what that means, but I, I kind of want to, like, experience that. I can't imagine that, but I want to I wanna know. And then, presumably, almost immediately, as John is saying this, Jesus shows up. But he's like, the one who I'm not even worthy to untie his sandal is coming. He's mightier than me. I'm baptizing you here. He's going to baptize you in a way that you can't even comprehend. And then Jesus walks up right after he's done preaching that message. And here's the fulfillment of the preparation. Now, I just want to say this. I couldn't come up with anything else. That might not even be a grammatically correct statement. Fulfillment of preparation. I don't know. But let's just pretend that it is, okay? But this is the fulfillment of all the preparation that's been taking place. Old Testament prophecies, John the Baptist come in to preach it, and now Jesus shows up. Verses 9 through 11. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. This is so awesome. John's preaching the message, I'm not even worthy to stoop to the level of a servant. And then he baptizes Jesus. Can you imagine, like, the, the, just the mental game that must be going on? Like, I'm not worthy, but, and we see it in, in other gospels. Like, he says to Jesus, I'm not, you should be baptizing me. I, I shouldn't be baptizing you. What are you talking about me baptizing you? Like, you're, you're, the, you're the holy one. You're the savior. You're the son of God. I, I can't, I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, oh, no, you will, because scripture needs to be fulfilled on, on, on the righteousness of the son. And so, so he baptizes him. I mean, it's just unbelievable, this whole scene, and, and it gets better because what does it say? When Jesus comes up out of the water, he sees, he sees, this isn't like in his subconscious, this isn't a metaphor to something, this is not like Jesus imagined it and it was spiritual and no one else could see it. He, he visibly sees the heavens parting. He sees somehow, supernaturally, the heavens parting and the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but it was something physical, Something was happening in that moment where he sees something, again, tangible happening in front of him. And then, as if that's not amazing enough, God the Father speaks out of the heavens. He speaks audibly, out loud. Think about this for a minute, right? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit descending. Right here in these few verses, we have the Trinity all working together to, in a way, commission Jesus for the next three and a half years of his ministry. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all participating in this act. I mean, you think it's important that all three of them are taking part in this moment of Jesus' baptism. And, and as he comes out of the water, there's this commissioning act that takes place, confirmation and evidence of the Trinity. And it's not just God that he speaks, but what he says is, again, just so unbelievable. He says, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. You are my son, confirmation that Jesus is the son of God. And that God the Father is affirming his role on earth as the Savior. 
Like, think about this, right? Like, Jesus is kind of somewhat silent for like 30 years. We see a little bit, right? We see his birth, of course, in, in the birth narratives. We see a little bit about his childhood as he goes to the temple and he, he, you know, his family leaves and he stays behind so that he can, he can learn and he can actually start to teach and people are blown away. Like, how does this kid know so much? Well, because he's, you know, he wrote the book. Um, but, how, you know, he's, we see that. And then it's like silence. We don't hear anything about him. What's he doing? He's just, he's living life as a man. Right? We know he was a carpenter, so he's learning the craft He's living and learning as a human being. He's experiencing everything that it, that it means to be human. The hurts, the joys, the pain, the, the sickness. And then the time comes for him to be presented. And what a way to introduce him. Heaven opening up, spirit descending, God the Father speaking out of the heavens. I mean, if that's not confirmation, I'm not sure what could be. And this is the beginning, Mark says. This is the beginning of the gospel. This is the beginning of the good news. This is where it all starts, right? We know in other, in other um, passages it really starts when he's born, right? That's, that's where it starts. Um, it probably actually starts in the, in the conception of Mary, the Holy Spirit conception. Probably that's where it starts. Actually, it probably starts before that when it's promised. I don't know. It probably starts before that when Jesus wasn't even created. Like, it's been around, right? <laughs> But Mark says the beginning of the gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, and it begins, his ministry begins here. We'll get to this next week. Immediately he's taken into the desert. He goes through that rigorous temptation of the enemy for 40 days, um, survives that, of course. And then it says Jesus begins his ministry, verse 14. Then he's like off to the races. It's like go time. But this is how it starts. This is where it begins. This is act one, scene one of the good news, the gospel of Jesus. Now. We could take this passage and we could apply it a few different ways. We could go a couple directions with this. But I really just want to kind of ask um, one question and then we'll we'll talk about it a little bit. But here's the question, okay? How much of John the Baptist do we have in us? Ask yourself that. How much of John the Baptist do I have in myself? Now, I'm not saying to go out, of course, and eat weird things, okay? Okay. What I mean by that is the messenger, the, the proclaiming, the boldness, the courage, how much of that do we have in us? Now, I'm not saying, don't hear me say this, okay? It's not up to us to save people. We cannot and do not save people. That's not our role. It's not up to us to do that. The Holy Spirit is the one that draws people to himself, but we do have a role to play. We have a role to play in the whole thing, and that is one of proclaiming the good news of the gospel to the world around us. Clearing the way, paving the way, making the paths straight. All right, let's take that metaphor of clearing the road. We have a lot of junk in our lives, don't we? There's a lot. Some of it can come in the form of baggage from our past. Some of it can be current hardships and things that are going on. But that stuff, that junk can kind of get in the way sometimes of people being receptive to anything having to do with Jesus. That stuff can get in the way. And not only can it get in the way, but I think sometimes it can create anger and bitterness towards God. So we have this baggage, we have this, this stuff from our past, we have maybe an experience from, from our upbringing, or maybe we have like a, a bad church experience that's left us kind of bitter, or whatever it is, there, there's something that might get in the way. And... This is the hardest thing to get past with people when you're trying to share the gospel with them, when you're trying to to clear the way, when you're trying to move those boulders out of the way and make way for Jesus. How do we how do we talk to people? How do we explain things to people? How do we how do we break down those barriers and how do we help them deal with those those things that are getting in the way? Well, as Christians, I mean we know the truth of the gospel, right? We know we know how it ends, we know how it happens, we know how it begins. That was backwards, but like we know all of that. Part of the gospel is, is God cleaning house, right? Part of the gospel is him removing all of that junk from our hearts. And he wants to take it, he wants to remove it. And oftentimes he wants to use it for his glory, but people need to understand that. Like, people need to understand that there is, there is hope in the removal of. There is, there is a, a, a piece of it that, like, God wants to use those, those, those burdens and that hurt and, and, and that, that bitterness sometimes. Like, he wants to use those things and turn it to, to be something for his glory. As followers of Jesus, we're able to help people process those things. 
You sit down and have a conversation with someone, and, and they're talking to you about their struggles or about what's, what's keeping them from, from making this decision. Like, I'll give you an example. I, I don't know if I've used this one before. I, I don't have a really good memory, uh, long-term memory, honestly. Like, I have a good short-term memory. Ask my wife about this. Um, maybe it's the other way around. I can't even remember that. <laughs> the other way? Okay. I have a good long, I have a good long-term, but not short. Neither. Okay. <laughs> okay. What did I just ask you? Okay. Um, I was sitting with a kid one time. Uh, this is not a kid that was part of our ministry, but I was sitting with, with this kid, and uh, we were at Bojangles. I remember it like it was yesterday, so maybe I do have a good long-term memory. Maybe it's selective. Um, I was sitting at Bojangles, and uh, we were sitting across the table, and I just felt like I'd, I'd gotten to know this kid. He was a student at a local high school. Um, some of his friends were in our youth group. So um, I just said, I said, you know what, I'm just going to sit down. I'm just going to just clearly share the gospel. I'm just going to present the gospel to him. And so I did, and um, he said, well, does that mean that I have, to, I have to give up these certain things in my life? Does that mean I have to, essentially, like I have to stop partying, I have to stop drinking, I have to, I said, well, you don't have to, um, but you'll be pleased to because life is far better than the things that you're doing right now. And so we talked through that. But because, because I knew the beauty of the gospel and I knew how, how Christ can transform a life and, and what he wants to do with our lives, I could sit there across the table and explain to him like, like that for him was a barrier to the gospel. He, he didn't accept Christ that day, by the way. It's not like a good ending to the story. Um, he didn't accept Christ that day because that he couldn't give that up. He wasn't ready to remove that barrier. He wasn't ready to get that stone out of the way and make way for, for Jesus. But I sat there and I explained it to him and I talked with him, man, like, yeah, I, I get it. Like, I know you're having fun, but like life is so much more. Life is so much better with Christ. I promise you that if, if, you, if you believe and you, and you give your life to him, you won't even, you know, maybe it'll be a temptation, but like you'll learn that life is better and you can turn your back on those things. And, um, and so we had that conversation. But as a follower of Christ, you, you sit there and you hear what they're going through and you know, you know how to talk with people through those things. You know how to, how to share the gospel in such a way that, that gives hope and provides freedom. And, and so it's a beautiful thing. But one of our responsibilities is to do that. We sit down with people and we help to clear the path and we help to make the, the way straight. And then the Holy Spirit who is drawing, things become clear and they're like, yes, I'm, I'm ready to accept Jesus. So that's our role. I like, like John the Baptist, we've got to be, we must be proclaiming Christ to the world around us. It's not just good news, it's the best news. And Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offers redemption through his blood, and we know it, we've experienced it. Um, and how dare us, shame on us to just sit and hold that in. Um, I sent this, this song, I've been listening to this song like almost every morning, and I'm not growing weary of it yet, maybe I will. But there's this song, and um, I'm, I hope I get it right, because I actually don't have it down here, I just kind of thought of this. But um, there's this song I've been listening to, and and um, it's, called, it's called Asleep in the Light, and it's by this guy called, his name's Keith Green, and maybe some of you guys know him, um, mid-70s to early 80s, and then he tragically passed away at, I think, age 28 um, in a plane crash. But the dude was like amazing songwriter, amazing singer, and all of his songs were just scripture. Like he just sang scripture, or he would take scripture and he would use scripture to influence how he wrote. Like he, he wasn't a big, you guys have sang like probably many, like name a couple songs that he wrote. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. That's his song, right, he wrote. Um, there is a redeemer, Jesus, God's own son. Um, that's the song that he wrote. So great songwriter, but he's got this song. And basically the whole song is how we we, we essentially now have Jesus, we've experienced Jesus, and we just kind of now just kind of rest. We kind of sit back, and we just, we just kind of go through life holding it in, living our lives, being okay with like, well, I'm good, and yeah, if an opportunity comes up, I guess I'll go and present it um, if, if I feel comfortable or confident enough, but maybe not because I'm a little scared, so maybe I'll shy away from it. Like, we tend to hold it in. And this whole song, I, I literally almost every day because it's so convicting, but he has this one line where he's like, you've been... You've been so well fed. You sit, basically, you sit in church, you soak it in, you take it in, you hear the word, you process it, you take notes, you learn how to apply it, you, you are well fed, and then the week comes and you can't even get out of bed. In other words, you can't even get up to go do something about it. Like you're so good at just taking it in, but then you just rest in that and like you don't go and, and you don't put it out there, you don't proclaim it. And that's what John does. He's like, I know it, how dare I hold it in? And this is what we can learn, and, and we could even take it another way, and, and we don't have time for it, but, like, we, we need to be ready for the second coming of Christ, right? Like, there's another, there's another time when Jesus comes back, and we could just take that whole application and talk about, are we readying ourselves for that? Are we ready every day? Are we, are we like, making ourselves ready for any moment the skies open up and Jesus comes back? 
Am I living in such a way that I'm expecting that, anticipating that, and, and being ready for that? So we see this passage where John is just this wild dude, but he believes wholeheartedly in his role. And we, in the same way, should believe that we've been left on this earth. I said it all the time to students, and I say it often here, like, why am I still here if I'm not doing this? What's the point of me still walking this earth if I'm not proclaiming the gospel? What am I here for? So we should take this and we should go, man, John, amazing, baptizing Jesus. But we too can proclaim. We've been called to proclaim. Why? Because it's the good news of Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, redemption through his blood. Let's pray. And uh, we're going to sing and then take communion together. Um, but let's see, yeah, let's pray together. God, thank you for, uh, for this, this passage. Thank you for Mark. And thank you um, how it's unique uh, from the other gospels and that it's just so um, action-oriented and it's just so much about um, what Jesus does and how he does it. And while our faith is not um, based on works, it should, we should, um, James says that, that our, our faith without works is dead faith. And so while we look at the works of Christ and, and how he ministers to people, which is not this morning, but we'll, we'll see how he ministers to people and how he loves people and how he speaks to people. And God, I pray that we be compelled to action and this morning as we see how, how John was the proclaimer of the good news and how he, in the face even of those Pharisees and Sadducees, um, was, was just throwing shade and just, just talking about judgment and how they were in trouble if they didn't repent and the response that he saw with people and how he was readying people for, for Jesus to come. God, I pray that we would be proclaiming the gospel because we know it, we've experienced it, and God, shame on us to hold it in. So maybe compel us forward, give us opportunities this week to, to love people like Christ, to, to speak about Christ to others, um, and proclaim that good news as well. We love you, and it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.